You want to see a magic trick? This right here is the Flywheel Explorer LR4. It's one of these micro long range four inches. I did a whole playlist where I reviewed a whole bunch of these guys, and this was one of the best. I'll put a link to that playlist in the video description if you want to check it out when you're done watching this video. Here's the magic trick. Pa bam! Yeah, they made a hexacopter version. And it's got the first six in one ESC that I've ever seen. If you want to build a hexacopter, this is the only ESC I know of on the market that actually can do a whole hexacopter in one board. And it's 20 millimeters too. So my first reaction when Flywoo offered to send this to me was, <clears throat> yes, <laughs> yeah, sure, I'd like to fly a, a four inch hexacopter. But the question that I think we got to tackle in this video is get past that and ask the question, is this actually a better aircraft than the quadcopter version? I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're gonna learn something today. Let's start this review by comparing the hexacopter frame to the quadcopter frame, because the quadcopter version of this frame has a heck of a pedigree. Dave C., uh, I'll put a link to his YouTube channel in the video description as well. He is a pioneer of this micro long range category, and he is the original designer of the frame that this is based on. Um, it even has a little tribute to him right there on the frame. So this is a good frame. What did they do to turn this frame into a hexacopter? Looking at the frames from the top down, not much has changed. The top plate is basically the same between them. When we flip them over, we can see that the bottom plate has been modified to accommodate the extra arms. The bottom plate has been extended here and the arms fit in. They're held in with a single screw and they have a Y shape at the base and they meet together here in the middle. That Y shape extends backwards to this stack screw here. Uh, so there are two screws holding this arm in place and it extends forward where it meets with the front arm. Weight wise, the quadcopter comes in at 165 grams. That's dry weight with no battery or anything else. The hexacopter comes in at 210 grams. So if you're trying to stay under that 250 gram limit, you're gonna really struggle to find a battery that keeps you under that while still giving you anything like a decent flight time. So the hexacopter is significantly heavier, but it has 50% more motors, so it can make presumably 50% more thrust. We're gonna take it out and fly it, of course we are, in just a minute. But before we do that, I wanna take a closer look at some of the things Flywoo has improved between the original uh, quadcopter version and this hexacopter version. This is not just the same quadcopter with two more motors. And I hope they roll some of these improvements back into the quadcopter version because they are significant. You probably can't tell just from looking, but the flight controller on the hexacopter has had a big upgrade. On the quadcopter, the flight controller uses an F4 processor. On the hexacopter, it's an F7 processor. And yes, an F7 processor is faster than an F4, but that's actually not the reason this is such a significant upgrade. The F4 processor has fewer UARTs and that means that when they designed the quadcopter, they chose to run the DJI on-screen display off of a soft serial port. And long story short, it means that the DJI OSD drops out and freezes up sometimes. And there are ways to work around that, but it's kind of annoying that you have to. The F7 processor on the hexacopter has I think it's five or six UARTs broken out. I'm not looking at it right here, but it has plenty of UARTs and all of the functions used, GPS, DJI OSD, receiver, what you name it, they are all on hardware UARTs. And that means that you don't have any of those problems with the on-screen display locking up. I hope that they roll that change back into the, the quadcopter version. I think that's a great move. Another improvement in the flight controller is that it's got a barometer on board now. It turns out that GPS is really inaccurate at altitude. And the best way to get altitude information is with a barometer, a pressure sensor. The older flight controller didn't have a barometer on board. And that means that when you do GPS rescue, it's gonna be all over the place with its altitude. And it's gonna waste energy. And it could climb to an unsafe height. So that's great news. But it's also great news because it means that Yes, this flight controller 
has an INAV target made for it. If you decide that you want to run INAV on this, it's very simple to flash it. There's no hoops to jump through. It is ready to go. Another problem that plagues these micro four inch builds is the GPS. It takes forever for the GPS to get a lock. Sometimes the GPS just doesn't lock enough satellites to make it useful. And sometimes it loses satellites while you're flying. Some people say that the reason for that is actually the Caddx Vista that the processor in the Vista or the processor on the quadcopter are running at a frequency that specifically interferes with the GPS signals. I'm actually working on a video about how to improve GPS performance on all quadcopters, but specifically these little micro long range quadcopters. That's gonna be coming out in the next few weeks. So definitely make sure you're subscribed to the channel and hit the notification bell down below so you don't miss that when it does come out. But Flywoo is not taking this laying down. Flywoo have taken one step to try to improve performance of the GPS. You can kind of see right here, they have wrapped the GPS wires in this copper foil. And that's to limit interference, electrical interference from other devices on the quad. That is minimally effective. It's most effective if you actually like solder a ground wire to the copper foil, but it's somewhat effective if you don't do that. Unfortunately, in my experience, it did. It still didn't really do a great job at locking GPS. So I definitely want to figure out some of those tips for how to get GPS working better. Nice try, good attempt. Just didn't seem that effective, at least on mine. Flywoo has also added a Bluetooth adapter. This is really freaking cool because a lot of people out there don't have a laptop or even if you do have a laptop or a computer, maybe you don't wanna bring it with you when you go out to the field and you still wanna be able to configure your, your flight controller. With a Bluetooth adapter on board, you can use the SpeedyB app made by RunCam. SpeedyB is RunCam. Uh, and you can look, there it is. Boom, and connecting. In addition, there is a Betaflight configurator app which it's not in the app store, you have to sideload it. And I'm also not sure if it supports Bluetooth or not, but it might. But the SpeedyB app definitely does. And look, voila, here we are, just looking at the configuration of the quadcopter. And we could do, you could do the whole configuration here. You could do every piece of the configuration from your smartphone. Um, Okay, the CLI stuff, the command line stuff is a little tedious to type on a, on a touchscreen keyboard, but other than that, it just totally works. Well, I may as well let you get a look at the freaking star of this show, the 6-in-1 ESC. And on the one hand, it's like, well, what is there to look at? It's just a, it's just like a 4-in-1 ESC, but with two more motor outputs. But on the other hand, it's like, it's a 6-in-1 ESC. Oh my God, what is this that I'm looking at? And sure enough, there it is with one, two, three motor outputs on this side. And yes, just as you would expect, one, two, three motor outputs on the other side. And I know it's totally plebeian, but also totally awesome. <laughs> Way to go, Flywoo. In addition to improving the build of the quadcopter, Flywoo also made some changes to the Betaflight setup. Some for the better, and there are some things that I personally am going to change before I go out and fly it. Let's take a closer look. Here in the ports tab, we can see the seven UARTs that this flight controller has. Seven freaking UARTs on a 20 millimeter flight controller? I'm kind of skeptical. Anyway, everything's on hardware as you would expect. Here in the power and battery tab, I would raise the maximum cell voltage from 4.3 to 4.4 if you're gonna use high volt batteries. And I would change the warning cell voltage from 3.5 to let's say 3.1 or maybe even 3.0 if you're gonna use lithium ion batteries, the lithium ions can go down to as low as 2.5 without actually being damaged. If you're gonna be running typical lithium, typical LiPo batteries, you can leave them at the defaults. Here in the receiver tab, I'm very pleased to see that they shipped the flight controller with AUX8 set up as the RSSI channel. That is on my Crossfire build and Crossfire can output RSSI or LQ as one of the aux channels. I've got a whole video tutorial about how to set that up. And if you're using DJI, you're definitely gonna wanna do it that way. If you're using analog, there's a, there's a better way to set up LQ and RSSI. I'll put a link to both of those videos down in the video description. But if you're used to Crossfire, you might be a little confused to see that it's set to aux 8 because Crossfire by default only has eight channels, which gives you only four aux channels. Crossfire actually can support 12 channels. What you need to do is go into the Crossfire receiver menu and change it from 8 to 12 channel mode. Now, I don't actually recommend that you leave it that way because there is some performance hit 
TBS won't say exactly what it is. So most people fly in eight channel mode, but what you can actually do is change it to 12 channel mode, set channel 12, aux eight to output LQ, and then change it back to eight channel mode. And it's still, it still works. You're still in eight channel mode, but you still have LQ on, on channel uh, 12. And then it's sort of the best of both worlds. Flywoo ships with the stick low threshold set to the beta flight default of 1050. And that's a good safety measure if you haven't calibrated the endpoints on your controller. But if you look right here, you'll see that when I move my sticks, the channel goes from 1000 to 2000. I've got my endpoints set correctly. If you need to know how to set your endpoints, I'll put a link in the video description for how to do that. Assuming your endpoints are set correctly, you can lower the stick low threshold from 1050 down to let's say 1010, and that will give you less dead band at the bottom of your throttle. Like I do with all of my DJI quads, I've got a custom OSD that I like to use. It's got everything you wanna see when you're flying with GPS, as well as some other basic information like cell voltage and RSSI, which DJI doesn't show by default. I'll put a link in the video description to a command line dump if you want to copy that and use it. Or of course you can set the OSD up exactly however you want. In the fail safe tab, I do recommend that you set aux eight or whatever channel you're using for RSSI that you change the fail safe behavior from hold to set and you change the value to 1000. That'll cause the RSSI to go to 0% when you fail safe instead of staying at the last value that it received. The hexacopter comes with GPS rescue set as its default fail safe behavior. So if you fail safe, it will attempt to fly home. However, Flywheel have made, I think they've changed this since I, I can't remember whether they had it this way or not with the, with the quadcopter, but they have enabled the allow arming without fix option. Then that means that if you don't have the minimum number of satellites at the time that you arm, it will still let you arm and fly. Just GPS rescue won't work. If you want GPS rescue to work, you have to manually remember to make sure that you have at least five satellites locked before you take off. Um, and that's the way I prefer to have it. Sometimes I just want to do a freestyle flight. I don't want to wait for the satellites to lock. Sometimes I know I'm going to do a longer range flight and I want to make sure I have GPS rescue there to back me up. But I'd like that to, to be my responsibility rather than me going, why won't you arm, please lock the satellites, especially if it takes a little bit of long time or maybe sometimes never lock satellites. All right, it's time to flight test this guy. And the first thing I always do with any quadcopter that I've got is take it out and try to freestyle it which some of you objected to because you're like, these are long range. These are not made for freestyling. And I'm like, I don't care. I just want to see how it, listen, when you watch Top Gear, whatever the car is, they take it out to the track and they drift it. Okay, but I'm off the hook on this one because Flywoo in their marketing materials that they sent to me, so I kind of knew what their position was for this quad. They say that the hexacopter has enough thrust to do freestyle, not just cruising, and to carry a GoPro. So this is a GoPro Hero 8. It's stuck on top of the hexacopter. We got an 850 milliamp hour 4S and the weight is, I think it's about 550 grams, but I'm gonna show you the actual weight on camera. Let's take it out and let's freestyle it and just see how we do. All right, moment of truth. How heavy is this freaking thing and at what throttle position does it actually lift off? Here we go. Boy, it's, it's a chonker. Feels like about 45%, maybe 50% throttle, yeah. All right, we're gonna give it a fair shot though. I should also tell you that Hypersmooth is turned on on the GoPro. I normally do not fly with Hypersmooth turned on for freestyle, but I'm kind of curious. These little quads always have a little bit of issue with stability. Like, let me just center the horizon and center the sticks and you should see just a little bit of bumpiness. And if I put the, yeah, you could totally see it. So if I put the uh, Vista DVR and the GoPro together, you can see that, you should see that Hypersmooth is smoothing that out just a little bit. But how, how can you, how good does it freestyle? I can feel the weight, but like for this kind of fast stuff, it feels like we're okay, we're okay. I'm a little higher in the throttle than I usually prefer to be or I'm used to be in, but it's doable. Let's do a full throttle punch. So it's not that fast and the battery sagged pretty bad. Oh, and we're coming down pretty hard. Okay. So, um, I mean, compare that to a five inch or compare it to a four inch with no GoPro on it. Yeah, there's a big difference. Whoa, yeah. 
but how like how flyable is it? Let's 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 get rid of our preconceived notions here and let's just try to freestyle it a little. So, oh, a little beepy there, a little beepy there from the yeah, a battery sag there. Oh, definitely 13.7. So this 850, uh, this 850 isn't cutting it. They said that for freestyle, you put between an 850 and a 1000. This 850 4S isn't cut, is not cutting it. It's not happy. It's, it's sagging out the minute I touch the throttle. It's pretty heavy. I gotta tell you, I almost feel like a better application for this would be for cruisy style flying. I know that's going to sound dumb because if you're doing cruisy style flying, then why wouldn't you just run a naked GoPro? Save yourself the weight. The disadvantage of the naked GoPro is its durability. But when you're doing cruisy style flying, you don't expect to crash too much anyway. So that's a fair trade-off. But a lot of people do not want to go to the effort and risk of tearing their GoPro apart. A lot of people prefer to just run a regular GoPro. And for this kind of cruisy style flying, you could run a Hero 8. You could have all the image quality and stabilization you want without any other risk of a naked GoPro, durability. And it definitely, oh, sorry, that was me, I jerked the stick there. That's not the quad. Uh, it definitely has more ability to handle that weight than the little quadcopter version of these four inches do. I think you could easily get you know, we're at uh, four minutes, 50 seconds here. We got to like three minutes, 30 seconds going hard and we were almost done. But now that I've let off the throttle and I'm just doing cruising, I mean, it's clear we could get six or eight minutes, maybe 10 minutes off this 850 pack of cruising and be carrying a full-size GoPro. And that I think is maybe a better argument for this hexacopter than, oh, you can do freestyle. Because the tune, the tune is just not up to the weight. The tune is not up to the weight uh, for a hard freestyle. And we're done. Well, okay, let's go a different direction. This is an 850 milliamp hour 4S pack. No GoPro, just the DJI. And I actually think there is a place for this. Now, if this was an analog quad, I wouldn't really be, unless it was like a super micro that just couldn't carry a GoPro at all, I wouldn't be saying, oh, maybe it's okay to fly it without a GoPro. But the quality of the DJI DVR, for me at least, is enough to convince some people that you don't need to carry a GoPro um, to get stuff that you enjoy watching afterwards. So. I think that when you, oh, that was my bad, that was my bad. I think that when you do this, you do end up with a quad that flies kind of decent. The throttle is right where I kind of like it to be in terms of how much power it's got and where it hovers. It's pretty zippy. It gets up in the air, lots of pop, lots of punch. And yes, it can. Freestyle. Oh, hello. Flying this a little more aggressively, it is fun to fly, but I'm not sure how I'd feel about crashing it. Now I am flying this aggressively uh, just to kind of show off its capabilities, but it definitely doesn't feel as loose and as nimble as like, for example, the Catalyst Machine Works Shocker. Oh, that bounce is still there. Oh, wow. Well, maybe that bounce is not the cause, is not caused by the weight of the GoPro. Maybe that's just the tune. Yeah, wow, big bounce, okay. The default tune, not tuned for freestyle. Um, it's it's uh, doesn't it's just not as snappy 
as like the Catalyst Machine Works shocker. And when you're coming in at this 300 gram weight, you are getting up there at a level where a quadcopter like the shocker is closer in weight uh, to this. Um, But here's the real question. What happens if we put that exact same 850 milliamp hour 4S battery on the quadcopter? Like, did we really gain anything with the hexacopter or is the quadcopter just better? Interesting. The um, throttle is... Interesting. The quadcopter feels way looser. It feels way looser, um, whereas the hexacopter feels stiffer. And maybe the tune, we'd have to check the tune to see if they're tuned differently. The hexacopter feels like you're flying a bigger quad. I mean, I guess you are, but it's, it's, that doesn't quite explain it entirely. Now. Wow, it is noticeably less powerful. I gotta tell you, I thought that the lighter weight of the quad was gonna make up the difference in the lack of thrust, but I don't think it does. This feels less powerful than the hex. It's just noticeably less powerful. How about the tune? No, well, you gotta bounce there too. Yeah, neither of them are really perfect. Oh dear, oh dear, get out of it. Ooh, son. Whew. So that brings us to the end of the video and as always, the question, should you buy it? And I think the answer to that question depends on what you wanna do with it. If you look at this quadcopter, it's a hexacopter, not a quadcopter. I'm gonna keep saying quadcopter. If you look at this hexacopter and you just say, it's a four inch hexacopter with a six and one ESC, OMG, I have to have it now, it's just so freaking cool. I know you're out there. I know you feel that way. There's a link in the video description to buy it. Um, interestingly, Flywoo is doing an 8% off holiday sale right at this exact moment. By the time you're watching this, it might be over. And Flywoo know that with the four inch Explorer, there were like weeks or months of delays for some of you before they shipped. They are promising on their website that if you order now, they will ship before Christmas, not delivery before Christmas, but ship before Christmas. So if you wanna order it, be my guest. But what if you actually like want to really justify the purchase with like logic and reasoning? If what you're concerned with is the longest possible flight time, then there's no doubt that the quadcopter delivers that. But the hexacopter was only about 85% the flight time of the quadcopter, which is not as much of a difference as I expected. And I have a theory that as you add weight to the hexacopter, I did the endurance test with a 550 milliamp hour pack on it because I didn't want to sit there for 30 minutes waiting for the battery to run down, right? I have a feeling that as you add weight to the hexacopter, that difference may go down because these motors will be screaming at full throttle to carry like a 3000 milliamp hour lithium ion pack. Whereas these motors will be lower in the throttle curve and motors have sort of a sweet spot in their efficiency curve. It's not all the way at the bottom. It's not all the way at the top. It's somewhere in the middle. I have a feeling that as you add weight, this guy will actually close the gap in endurance compared to this guy. So the hexacopter may actually be a viable long distance, longer range cruiser. And hey, if you do break a prop or lose a motor or something, you will be able to actually fly home which is an advantage of larger hexacopters that kind of doesn't, probably doesn't really apply on this small one, but it is nice to know. Even if you're not too concerned with flight time, the additional power of the hexacopter makes a big difference when carrying additional weight. You put this 3000 milliamp hour lithium ion pack on the, heck, on the quadcopter and you can feel it. And if you end up fighting a headwind coming home, or if you end up in a big dive and then need to pull out at the last minute, you just may not have enough throttle, enough power to do what you need to do. Having those extra two motors makes a big difference. You're still higher in the throttle curve than you would be with a typical racing or freestyle quad, with a typical five inch quad, but you have a lot more headroom to get stuff done on the hexacopter when carrying additional weight. 
And that means that it's even potentially viable to carry a full-size action camera like this Hero 8 on the Hexacopter. It doesn't fly great, and if you push it too hard, the battery sags a lot, but I really, on the quadcopter version, I really wouldn't even think about it. It probably would get in the air, but you just would have no throttle left to actually get anything done. What about freestyle flying? Flywoo in their marketing materials says that this is okay for freestyle flying, and I don't agree. Yes, it has more power than the quadcopter. It has enough power to freestyle, but it just flies badly. And I'm not sure if that has something to do with the hexacopter design, like the way the motors respond is making it fly worse, or whether that's the tune that they delivered, right? It just wouldn't be my first choice for freestyle flying. In addition, like how is the durability going to be in a crash, right? I don't know. It's an extension of the Dave C Explorer frame, which is designed for lightweight, not durability. I just don't think this is a great freestyle, no matter how you slice it. If you are interested in four inch freestyle, this is the Catalyst Machine Works Shocker 4 inch, and it is freaking amazing. It is an amazing freestyle ripper. I've got a review of it up on my channel. I'll put a link in the video description if you want to check it out. And I definitely suggest that you do if you're at all interested in 4 inch freestyle. This quad actually, I thought was going to be something that just knocks the hexacopter out of the running. Uh, because this quad, it's four inches, it's a quadcopter, but it has 2004 sized motors. And they are, they're about 125 cubic millimeters versus about 88 cubic millimeters for the 1404 motors on those other quads. And the, the bigger motors make up a lot of difference. I thought we were gonna find that this shocker would have similar weight carrying capacity, better handling, a more durable frame compared to the hexacopter. And I thought my conclusion was going to be that in a world where this exists, there's really no reason other than novelty to go with the hexacopter. But I don't think that that is true. The Shocker has shorter flight times, not a lot shorter, but shorter still compared to those guys. And it just doesn't have the same weight carrying capacity as the six, the extra two motors do have more of a difference. But the handling is just not there on the, six, on the hexacopter for freestyle. In conclusion, if you are looking for basically something like this, but you're willing to sacrifice just a little bit of flight time for a significantly more sort of thrust and throttle headroom, then take a look at this. And if that is you, there's a link in the video description to the product page, and it's an affiliate link. And that means that I get a small commission if you make any purchase at the affiliated vendor after you click that link. You want to buy this, you want to buy the quadcopter version, you want to buy anything else, click the link, make a purchase, I get a little commission, it helps support me, and it doesn't cost you anything, it means a lot. What do you think of this guy? Are you interested? Are you impressed? Are you like, why did anyone do this? This is just a dumb novelty? Let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching. Happy flying. What are you doing in here? The least you could do is subscribe or join my Patreon or like just here's another video I picked out for you. Jeez.